for his experience, strength, and hope for approximately 45 minutes. We ask that out of respect for our speaker, everyone remain seated until our speaker is finished. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Mike. Hi everybody, my name is Mike and I'm an alcoholic. I want to say uh, happy to be here. I want to welcome the newcomers and the birthday. It's a big deal, let me tell you. Um, gosh, you know, I know there's a lot of... Hey, can, can I see a show of hands of the people with less than 90 days? Can you raise your hand? I want to welcome everybody here, you know, and it's a big deal. Um, so, there's stuff that goes through my head about when I was sitting there and watching what's going on and, and I remember my first AA meeting. Well, I remember it, well, the first day that I had and there was, I went to a detox center and it was just a little group of about 10 people and they start going around the room, everybody introducing themselves and they're saying they're an alcoholic and I go, oh shit, I'm gonna have to say I'm an alcoholic. And that was hard, I did not wanna do that. And then the other, we went to a hospital that night for a speaker meeting. And I remember I stood up, like all the newcomers, but I just said my name, Mike. I didn't say I was an alcoholic. And, and they weren't real happy with me that I didn't say I was an alcoholic, you know. And I didn't want to admit I was an alcoholic. I was not thrilled about being an alcoholic, but I saw that I was an alcoholic. Um, to this day, I'm not real happy about being an alcoholic. But what I've done is I've accepted it, you know. And that's a part of me, and uh, uh, so it's been it's been quite the ride. And um, you see, I was a young man when I got here, and you see the gray hair here. Once upon a time, they didn't think I was going to live that long. My little sister used to. We were so wild and crazy. She used to say something was going to happen. I don't know what was going to happen, but something was going to happen. And that's how I drank, and that's how I used drugs, and. And I started at a very young age. Um, what I can tell you, I was 13 years old, and they used to do drug week in junior high. And they, the evils of drug use. And, uh, uh, and, and so what was going on with me at that time was, was I was pretty much emotionally shut down. My parents were go going through a divorce, so I'm not feeling a thing except pain and maybe some anger, and that's all I'm feeling. And I tried drugs and some drinking in there. It wasn't all, all, but when I got, when it happened, I go, they lied to us. This is fabulous. That's what I thought. They lied. And uh, what happened was, as a result of doing that, I felt so much better. You know, I felt good. I was happy. I wasn't shut down and closed. It was like, ah, oh, this is great. And that's my first experience with drinking. It was on New Year's Eve, and we drank a bottle of wine and smoked some pot, and it was, it was really good. Um, there's no question about it. And uh, I did all my drinking. I grew up in Oklahoma City. Uh, I was born in Texas, grew up there, moved there when I was five years old, started drinking at 13 years old. And uh, actually, when I was young, um, it was more, but when you're 13 years old, your body just doesn't metabolize alcohol very well, so you're puking a lot. So the drug was, was easier. But there's somebody shaking their head, they understand. <laughs> and uh, by the time I was 16, I was taller and uh, I was bigger and I was more able to drink. And, and I kind of, right around then too, I kind of slowed down on the, on the drug use, except for maybe smoking pot. And that was my drug, two drugs of choice, alcohol and smoking pot. And, uh, you know, I've been told I'm not supposed to talk about drugs. You know, I, I had a, a guy that I used to play golf with, and he was kind of a stickler on that. And he goes, he goes, you know, drugs don't belong in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and I looked at him and go, oh, really? He goes, I go, but if I smoke pot, do I got to change my sobriety date? And he goes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, he, he, I go, so it does have some effect. The point is, when I first got sober, I used to say I was an alcoholic and an addict, and that helped me accept my disease, and then eventually I dropped the addict, and I just was introduced myself as an alcoholic. But the point is, is that, yes, this is an alcoholic, Alcoholics Anonymous, so we try not to do a lot of talk on, on drugs. 
Um, but these days, I would bet everybody in here just about did it, you know, except maybe some of these old guys over here, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so, so I, I partied all through junior high and high school, and it was really fun. And I was a, a pretty, pretty much a juvenile delinquent, and we grew marijuana, and we smoked, and we drank, and we stole out of garages, and we did all kinds of stuff, and uh, got in some trouble um, along the way. And I went off to college. I, I, even though I was drinking and, and doing drugs, I still had some retention in here. And so I was able to do some schooling. I went to the University of Oklahoma for a year and pretty much drank the whole time and came out of there with 13 units and a 1.0 grade point average after two semesters, you know? And it was terrible, you know, it was. Yeah, I'm clapping on that one, huh? <laughs> That's right. So then I went and worked as a cement mason apprentice and uh, for a year, worked construction, and uh, I was making good money and I was drinking every night, and it was pretty good, I mean, but it, I, God, by Sunday, I'd be deadbeat, sick as a doornail, couldn't drink. I was just sick as a dog on Sunday because the routine went. I drank till who knows what time at night, got up at early to go to work. By lunch, I'm starting to feel better, but I was in the morning when I'm getting there to work, I'm going, I'm not drinking tonight because I feel like shit. And then, um, you know, I have lunch, start feeling better go to work, finish the day, get, a, get some beer, go home, eat. Oh, I'm fine, now I can go out and drink. But, and that went on for a long time. And, and uh, then uh, uh, I got in some more trouble, and boy, that, that got my attention. And, uh, you know, some things happened, and I'm not gonna go into details on the whole thing, but it changed, it cha I, I had a, a psychic change, but I didn't get sober yet. And then, in a spiritual experience, kind of to the to the deal, but um, I decided I didn't. I got because of the trouble and working. I didn't like getting dirty, lifting these hundred pound bags of cement in a cement mixer and then rolling it over to the guy. And I'm going, man, college was a lot easier. And there was pretty girls there too. And I says, I'm going back. I'm going back to college, and that's what I did. And uh, you know, my alcoholism at that time was up here but it backed off the line some. It's a, it's a progressive disease. I don't know if they've explained that to you in the treatment centers, but it is a progressive disease and it grows up. And when all that stuff happened, I came back down that line some. And actually, when I, when I, after it happened, I didn't drink for like a couple months, or I don't remember the time frame. but then um, I went back to school and started hanging out with the guys that I grew up with again. And, uh, uh, it slowly progressed back up again, my drinking and my disease and the whole thing. So um, what happened was I was 24 years old. I had a roommate that I'd known since grade school, and we, we, we had partied all through the whole time. I'd known him the whole time. And his name was Bucky, and I started watching his drinking. I go, holy cow, this guy's got to drink every day, and he's smoking pot too. And all of a sudden, I started looking at me, and I and go, I'm doing the same thing. And I wanted to quit, and what was happening was I'm supposed to be graduating. And, and at that point, I don't know if you guys use it, your life's supposed to go like this out of college, and my life was going like this because of the drinking and the booze. And so I, I tried to quit on my own, and I couldn't do it. I lasted three days, and I couldn't do it. And I go, okay, I'm going to have to get some help. And, and so they're doing these commercials on, on television, jumping out of airplanes. If you have a problem with alcohol, call this phone number. And it was, it was a, a, a detox center. And I called them, this is, and I told them what was going on. They said, well, you need to come down here. And so I went down there and checked in for seven days. And, you know, the first thing that happened when I went in there was I, I started detoxing from the drugs and alcohol. And... Uh, the other, th other reason, too, why I got sober was I'd never really dealt with the pain of that divorce, and I was just in a lot of emotional pain. So, uh, 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 somebody told me that's when you started feeling your feelings, and that got me, and that's what got me here because I, I just couldn't cope. I mean, when I drank, I was great, but the rest of the time, I was like, ah, oh, geez. And so 
that's what got me in here were, were, were those two scenarios. And I went into, I, I tell you something, and, and this, is, this is something that has come up in the last three or four days. It's like, when I got here, I'd never been to a meeting. I had no idea what Alcoholics Anonymous was. But I did know this. I did know before I even walked in that door that being sober meant no alcohol, no drugs, nothing from the head up. Because I knew I could, I could go back and do drugs, and it, it wouldn't be sober. And, and, and sometimes that needs to be spoken in these rooms because being sober is from the head up. Nothing, not even thing. I mean, I don't like to take anything. I'll take some ibuprofen, you know, if I got something going on, but I don't like to take anything. And so it's important to know that, you know. And, and, uh, but I, and I went through this detox center, and I know back then they didn't have a lot of treatment homes. Either you went home and started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings or you went into a, a treatment center in a hospital and some of the people that I was in there with went into treatment centers and they needed the medical help and attention in the hospital because uh, of some of the some of the things that they were with really bad withdrawals and they're in bad shape and they needed that and so after the seven days they pointed they did t two things I, I told you about the withdrawals I was shocked that I had alcoholic withdrawals or drug it was like it, it was a problem after about three days it all showed up and I'm going oh man I got a bigger problem than I thought and then the other thing they told me was, they told me, I remember sitting in the bed and this guy tells me, can you just stay sober for 24 hours, one day? And uh, I looked at him, I go, oh yeah, no problem, that's easy. It, which is bullshit, but that's what I told the guy. And, and that's what it is. We stand in here and now we stay sober for this 24 hour period. That's the, that is really important to grasp. Whatever's going on, it's not that big a deal. Whatever is going on, it will eventually pass. So, that, so drinking will just make things worse, and and you will get past whatever's going on. So, um, they pointed me to an AA clubhouse called the Western Club in Oklahoma City, similar to this. It was a little bigger, but speaker meetings, regular meetings, the whole works. Said 90 meetings in 90 days, and I started going to meetings and and uh, you know I didn't know anybody, and I was really shy. I was really introverted. I didn't. When I drank, I wasn't. When I drank, I was, oof. But, but when I was sober, I was really introverted. I'm not the same person today that I was then because I wouldn't even get up in front of a crowd. I didn't even hardly share when I first got here. You know, I did not like attention. I did not like to be up in front of people. A lot of people love it. I'm not like that. I don't like to be in, at the center of attention at all. And so, but I went to meetings and I got to know some people and that helped, you know, getting to know people and going consistently to these meetings. I got to know people and uh, that helped me to kind of break into Alcoholics Anonymous, get to know people. And I'll tell you a story how I got my first sponsor and this is just wild. So we go to these meetings. I went to a lot of 530 meetings and uh, this one guy from across the room, every time he saw me, he would want to come over and give me a hug. And he was gay and it was like, God, you know, I was just going, geez, get away. So, so I, my first, my first, uh, my first career was, I was a professional driver and he was working for a furniture company and, uh, we, I was going to drive this furniture truck from Oklahoma city to Tulsa and he was riding shotgun. And so we come out of this Mexican food restaurant after eating lunch and I'm going to drive this truck up there. And, it, and it, when I got out, I finally says, you know what? You and your gay friends need to stay away from me. That's what I told him. <laughs> and and so, so, so we get in this truck, and it's an hour and a half drive from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. And he proceeds, me to, proceeds to tell me his story and what happened. and how He had a couple years of sobriety, maybe more, I don't know. And when he told me, and, and the truck's loud, and he's kind of got to yell to tell me what's going on. And, and but by the time he told me his story, it was like it broke down the walls and it changed everything. And we became good friends at the time. And then eventually he ended up sponsoring me and we worked the steps. So this is where it gets funny. It was like, I don't know how many years later, I'd moved to California and uh, he comes out and I'd seen him and I hadn't seen him in a while. And I'm going, you know, I felt, felt love for him. And I'm going, oh, I really feel love for him. And then all of a sudden I'm going, Ah, uh, shit, I'm gay. You know what it's like? <laughs> but it was. It was a good relationship. It, it, well, in the time that we were together, it was really good. 
But he was a loving, kind human being, which I hadn't really had anything like that in years. I mean, even getting a hug was like, I hadn't had any physical contact in a long time either, you know. Drinking bars, you know, and, and wasn't letting people get close and working construction and going to college and, you know, didn't have any of that. So um, I got an opportunity from Oklahoma City from my, old, from my mom's old boss to move to Southern California. Went out there, loved it, and, and came back, finished the classes I was taking, and loaded up the car and left. So I'll tell you the tornado story in Oklahoma City. was. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, it's Tornado Alley, and I always wanted to see a tornado live. We used to be drunk, driving around in cars, looking for tornadoes, and the radio's going nuts, and it's pouring rain, and the water's over the sidewalks, and we're looking for the tornado, and it's dark. The only time you can see a tornado is lightning hit, you know? We're, we were just crazy. No fear when he drank, and, and so never saw a tornado until the night before I'm going to leave. And, or no, it's the afternoon, and I'm getting my truck ready to drive cross country, and uh, and you hear on the radio all the all the warnings and sirens and all this, and uh, next thing I I was living in a farmhouse north of town, just a crappy little farmhouse, and and getting the truck ready, and the guy that was the guy that was there with me, he he somehow he can connection with the house and that's how I got in there. He was John Paul. He was a big mountain man with big guns and and uh, had grown marijuana up in, I don't know, one of the big northern California counties, whatever it was. And so we're in there and I'm probably seven months sober and all of a sudden here comes this tornado and it's coming right at us. And we're looking at it and holy cow. I go, John, you see that? He goes, yeah, I see that. So it gets so close that we, this old farmhouse had a storm cellar and we ran down in the storm cellar and we're down there waiting for this thing to pass and uh, he's crying. He's a big strong guy and he's just bawling he's so, and it's a loud thing and what happened was this tornado that was coming right for us on the house kind of swished a little bit and went across the road and hit the track of houses across the road. I don't know how many houses it hit but I know that the power was out, the National Guard was called and that was my tornado story, you know? And if it would have hit us, I probably would have never made it to California. You come out of it, and this is wild too, you come out of that storm cellar and you walked out, and right where we walked out, there must have been a log maybe this big around, six inches and about six feet wide, and it was vertical in the side of the building. You know, it's just wild, you know? And uh, so that was my last night in Oklahoma, and then got in the car and drove out. And, and I can tell you, you know, looking back at what happened, I'm not talking about torrent, I'm just more talking about, about what happened with me. I didn't know it at the time, but, so I'm a baby boomer, and this was the mid-80s when I'm going to California, and th there was a whole shrew of baby boomers that did the exact thing I did. They partied all through the 70s into the mid-80s, and they just burned out. So I got stuck in this group where I was living, and, and so there was a ton of us that were getting sober, and what got me was I was a sports guy. I, I played a lot of sports up until I started, started uh, getting, getting so, or once I started drinking, I quit playing sports, and I hadn't played anything in 10 years. And so I get out there, and they're playing this softball on Sunday, sober softball, on Sunday morning, or Sunday, really Sunday, they had a meeting and then they'd have the softball, and sometimes they'd have enough people out there to play three games at once. And uh, that became my group, you know, it became my peer group. And, you know, not only did we play softball, we went to meetings together, we get dinner together, we went to movies on Friday night together. And, you know, I'm still friends to some of those guys to this day. And, and, and so, to kind of put that into terms, that's why it's important to go to meetings, because you can get a peer group like that by going to meetings and getting to know people. And uh, uh, it was just something that happened. I played, I took it to an extreme, but, but within two or three years we're playing tournaments. They also had sober tournaments there, and I'm playing big tournaments. We went to the world in 97 and all this other stuff, but you know, it, but it was something that I loved, and I got back into playing sports once I got sober. 
and because I hadn't done anything for years. And uh, when I first started, my eye hand coordination wasn't there, and it, it got better. The more sober I got, and the more I played. So it was just interesting how it all went. And uh, you know, I got a sponsor in California. We started working the steps, and. Uh, you know, if I can't go for 45 minutes, we may go home early, just so you guys know. But uh, I'm looking at this good. So I got a sponsor. Oh, I want to talk about the first step and what happened with me. So with this sponsor, this one, the, the, his name was Bill, the gay guy. He had me working the steps. And the first step, and it was really cool, this is what happened, was that he had me take a sheet of paper out and lit. So it, our, our lives... We admitted we were powerless over our clothes, but our lives had become unmanageable. So he had me put a sheet of paper where my life was powerless and another sheet where my life was unmanageable. And one of the things that came up when I did that was I remember being in college and I went in my bar that I hung out with, with and I knew everybody in there. And I was, I, it was a Thursday night and I was only going to have two drinks and then I was going to go home because I had to get up the next day. And as soon as I took those two drinks, it was on. And I remember just watch, taking those drinks and the alcohol taking effect. I could just feel it. And then I was off. And that's how I drink. You know, a couple drinks and I'm on my way. And uh, that's what, so that story comes up. Same thing with the unmanageability. I'd lost from the time I was 16 to the time I was 24, I'd had over 40 jobs. And that came up on the list. As a result, I never had a problem with interviews, job interviews, because who, who knows how many interviews I had to get those 40 jobs, you know? It's like, um, but that came up, the problems with the law, the problems with the family, you know, not being able to stop drinking. And like that day I was talking about when I had the two drinks and kept on, I was there in that bar till 2 o'clock in the morning when they flicked on the lights, and there was no way I made it to school the next day. And that was a perfect example for me. What it did by listing what I talked about, I saw my alcoholism. You know, I could see it. It was right in black and white, you know. And to this day, I mean, it really became apparent, all right, I'm definitely an alcoholic. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to be, I wanted to do something. I didn't want to just sit around and party. And so for me to get sober, the solution was Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started going. And if you're new, I think the treatment centers are fabulous in the sense that that I got structure when I was growing up for mom. I mean, we were had to be in bed at a certain time. We got three meals a day, so I knew how to create structure. And I think what I see lacking a lot of times is structure. And this and these these recovery homes are going to teach you structure. They're going to teach you to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's an expensive introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous, but you know what? You're getting here. You know the key to the whole thing is: is are you willing to learn? You know, and and I remember I I was going to meetings, and you know I don't know how long I've been here. Not that long, a couple months. And I remember I think it was I got sober in October, and it was January, and I'm sitting in a meeting, and I go, you know what, Mike. Your way's not working. And you know what? It might be wise to, to learn, you know, to sit in these meetings and listen to what these people have to say because it's pretty obvious my way wasn't working. And so it kind of opened up my mind and made me teachable, you know. I don't know if, how, what each one of your situations is. What I see a lot of, people, you're just, a lot of them were just taking, some, some are just taking up space, just what, buying time, and then they're gone again. You know, but it, 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 this is a process, and it's a new way to learn how to live life sober. You know, that's the whole deal. So um, just food for thought on that. Um, but it is a deal because it's an introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous through the recovery home, but eventually you're going to have to go to meetings on your own if you, you decide you want to do this and stay sober and do this. It's just kind of how it works. So anyway, I, I did go to almost 90 meetings in 90 days. And I think I might have missed a day or two. And then even after that, I mean, I probably, once I had even a couple years, I probably went at least, you know, four, three to four times a week. And then and my whole social output was sober people, you know. I, I, I had friends I'd known since I was grade school that I drank through, through up until, you know, when I got sober. And they kind of, they just kind of fell by the wayside, and I had a new group 
that was sober, trying to stay sober and doing, doing the deal, and that was fabulous. You know, I didn't realize it at the time, that's what was going on, but that was the deal, and so, 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 uh, you know, that, that's the first, and then, and then, you know, the second step, at the time, to restore to sanity, I was having nightmares, and that's how I applied that, but now, today, looking at it, it's much different, because if they're saying we're getting sanity, it kind of means we're insane. But the thing was, is I didn't know this thing wasn't working very well when I got sober, because of all the drug use. It was, it was, it was, it was. Uh, what's the word? Um, wake up, Catherine. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was foggy. My brain was foggy and had cobwebs in it, and it took like, it took like, I don't know. It took like. I think three years, three, three and a half years before this thing started functioning properly, you know, and I'd smoked pot all through some formative years. So it took a while for this thing to come back. But the problem was I didn't know this thing wasn't working very good, you know. I just didn't know it. And uh, uh, so how I did that, w the big thing was having a sponsor to bounce stuff off of. and you. I had to take it to somebody, lay it out, this is what's going on, what do you think? And then I get some different input on it. And then, okay, they'll do that. What a lot of people do in Alcoholics Anonymous, they do whatever they want, and then they go tell their sponsor. And that doesn't work very well, let me tell you. Because usually what my thought is, especially in those first three years, it's not working. What I'm thinking is not very good, you know? So, um, but I will give you guys compliments. Your best thinking got you here. You got it to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a big deal. So um, I did a third step on Christmas night. And I was probably 60 days sober. And I made it through the holidays without drinking. And I'd taken my first, my first drink on New Year's Eve. And I got to January 2nd. And the obsession to drink was removed. And I'd wanted to drink for the whole 60-something days that it was. I, I wanted to really drink every day. And I remember on Fridays it was really bad because it was the weekend, it was time. And I had a hard time with that. And uh, what happened was somewhere after doing that third step on January 2nd when it was removed, it was a really big deal, a yeah, really big deal. And I went, real quick, a lot of people are afraid of the fourth and fifth step. I was not afraid of it. Um, I was willing to get honest. Now, most of that fourth step was mom, but you know what happened is, is uh, it was a really the thing about that was the life changer on a deal was actually sharing some stuff, and I told on myself too on stuff I did, and it, and I'd never really opened up to anybody, and it was like taking a big bag of weight off my shoulders and I was a lot lighter and I felt fabulous after I did it. And the one thing that comes to mind on all that was, so I wanted to point, it was your fault. It wasn't my fault, it was yours. And so we are not looking at the other person, Mike, we're looking at your behavior and what you're doing, it's an inventory. And what happened was when I took the blinders off and I saw that, it was a big change because because instead of just looking at them, I looked at me, and then I could see, and I could see both sides of the street, and it was an eye-opener on the whole thing. And, and I know it's scary, and it's tough, and you look at that. I know the third step's tough, too. You want me to turn my will and my life over to what? You know, it's like you, you have no faith. Or I didn't, I had some, but I didn't really think he had much to do with me. So you're going to do these steps, and it's just a process. Eventually, what, what has happened is, as I've gotten sober and been along, there is a higher power. He is working in my life, and he wants good things for me. But I don't get all the things I want, let me tell you. And it comes slowly. And I'll never forget the first sponsor in California that I had, and I had about a year and a half of sobriety. And I was complaining about my life and what was going on. And uh, he, he said to me, well, how long did you drink and use, Mike? I go, Oh, probably 12 years, 13 years. He goes, you think you're going to fill that hole up in a year and a half? And it was, he was so dead on right. It was like, holy cow, you know, it's like, and that's how it is. Like you hear all these stories 
and you think, oh, it's going to turn around in three or six months. Well, it's not like that. It's going to take some time. And it, what it was was I had to get better first. So the way this thing works is the 12 steps, I work them. It changes me in here and here. It changes me in here. Then the outside world changes. It's not going to work. You're not going to change the outside world. It's got to come from inside and then out. And, and that's a big deal, you know. If you can even understand that, that's a big deal, you know, because that gives me motive to, okay, I'm going to do what my sponsor says, and I'm going to work the steps, and I'm going to change here, and then it's going to change out here. And it, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual concept, principle, so to speak. Uh, to grasp that is, is something, you know. And, and that's, this is it, you know. This is where it's at. The sponsor's not going to change your life. He's going to have some encouraging words and do whatever, but it's, it's, it's a result of the 12 steps that change. And, uh, you know, and, and turning over the, the character defects after you do that step and then making amends. I'll talk about the biggest amends that I had, as I already talked about it, was my mom. And what happened was, boy, I had a big resentment. She was controlling it. It was a difficult relationship. And she'd gotten in Al-Anon, and we actually made amends together on a nine step with that. But it didn't take. It didn't, it didn't change anything. And she was going off to the Ukraine to be a missionary, and it was dangerous. And, and I remember we are sitting in a Chili's restaurant, and I remember saying, Mom, I just want you to know something. I just want you to know that I forgive you. And she almost started crying. And at that moment, our relationship changed big time. And we had, a, that was probably, gosh, that was a while ago, probably 93. And after that, we, our relationship changed. And we had a really good relationship after that. It was still difficult sometimes. Uh, sometimes I just have to flat out ignore her. But it's like, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, uh, we were similar. We were really alike, and that's why it was probably easy. Once, once the, the, the resentment and all the anger subsided at the word, I forgive you, Mom, and I meant it. And, and, and what happened was we were similar. We are both um, entrepreneurs. We were both uh, golfers, uh, sports. We were both uh, same political kind of whatever, and... and uh, with all that, we just had enough in common that it was really easy after that. We had a really, and I miss her. I tell you right now, she's got dementia. She would be really. I shouldn't talk about. It. I say she'd be tore up about what's going on in Ukraine after spending all that time. And uh, but you know what? What a great deal. Matter of fact, because I was a, I was, I was such a piece of crap when I was younger. And uh, you know, when she about ten years ago, she hands me this envelope, and goes, "You're it." And I go, what? And this was her trust. And I was the trustee of her trust. And uh, which was just like, wow, you know, that was a really big deal. Um, and I'm still dealing with that today. But, you know, it's like that, that was something to, to have a big change from being nothing to, to, to something. And she trusts me enough to, to take care of her affairs. Um, that was a really big deal. And, uh, you know, I want to talk about, I don't know if you guys can grasp what I'm, what I'm about to talk about, because I know when I was new, I mean, 8, 9, 10, 11, or whatever, one of the steps that ha has had a really big effect on me in the last probably 10 years is step 11. And I want to back up a little bit on that. So when I first got sober, I was, I was only like, I was probably eight months sober, and I made friends with this guy who I played softball with, and he had about four years of sobriety, and he goes, Mike, here's the deal. If you want to stay sober... You're going to have to pray to this higher power every morning. You know, hit your knees, pray, and ask them to help you stay sober. Now, let me just say this. It's not a complicated prayer. It's, God, please help me stay sober. That's what it was. And you need to hit your knees. And I, and I didn't want to do that, you know. And so, but I did say the prayer. And eventually, I did start hitting my knees most morning. No, no, sometimes I forget, but I'd still say the prayer. Please help me see. Guess what? You know what happened? I stayed sober, you know, I stayed sober and I had help, you know, and that's what I was looking for. And, and, and the other thing that comes in there and it talks about it in book, in the book, in Bill's story, that was the message Ebby had to Bill was that 
you're going to have to find some sort of higher power to remove this obsession to drink. That's what it is. That's one of the big messages in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what happened to me with doing that third step, you know, because it's a, it's a disease, it's obsession. The first drink triggers this allergy, and I'm off and running. And that's how, that's alcoholism. That's the deal, you know. So, so, so I want to talk about, this is, one, this is my favorite story. There is some ego in this, but whatever. So uh, I'm playing, I, I played sports, and I quit playing softball, but we played in big games, so I was, I was decent under pressure, so I started doing it in golf. And so I started playing this team play in golf, and there was this guy that, uh, at, at this one, one golf course, and I started watching him, and he was really loud and boisterous. And then I'm watching, he was, a, he was a little better at me at the time, and he was in the group in front of me, and I looked down, and there's two, it's 9.30 in the morning, and he's teeing off, and there's two tequila sunrises sitting on the thing, and it's his, you know? And it's like, so I was watching this guy for a while, and then, I don't know how many years later it was, I'm, I, I, we show up at his place, and I'm playing him. Now, the way it works is, is, is you're supposed to win on your home course. And I'll never forget, he's loud and boisterous, just like when I first saw him. His name was Bob. <laughs> it was like, it was so funny. So we played him, and he's loud or whatever. And, and, the, and it was a good match. It was a really good match. And we were down a little bit, but we got back in the match. And I told my partner, who was playing Bob at the time, he goes, if we can get these guys to even, when we get to the 18th hole, he'll implode. And, and my partner's looking at me, what are you talking about? I go, I didn't tell him why I knew that, because he's an alcoholic, and he's gonna, he'll crush under the pressure. I birdied 17, and we were even, and sure as shit, we got to 18. And the first guy hit it in the water, and then Bob hits it in the sand trap over here, and a second shot out of the sand trap went, went out of bounds, and we ended up winning the match. And it was, I just knew what was gonna happen. So, so after the match is over, they have the big drink truck, behind the deal and, and there's about half the guys there and I hear Bob go, I hear Bob go, that Mike, he's such a sandbagger <laughs> and I've been sober, I've been sober for a while and I looked at him and I go, I said it right out out, I said fuck you Bob, right in front of everybody <laughs> and, then, and then so, so a couple, about a minute later I hear, that Mike, he's such an asshole. <laughs> so, so the next week we're playing my place, okay? And, and I'm playing Bob this time. You know, they have a team, they have two individual matches and they have a team and I'm playing Bob straight up the next day. And so Bob is just as loud and obnoxious. So this is two weeks in a row. We're, I'll never forget this. We're on the fifth hole. I'm in the middle of the fairway. He's in the rough behind two gigantic eucalyptus trees, and he's got no shot, and he's just running his mouth, and I'm ready to kill him. I'm flat out ready to beat his ass. I shouldn't talk like that, should I? But, uh, and I've been sober for a while when this is happening, let me tell you. So my sponsor, who was a, he had been working on me, and in a big book it talks about pausing, you know, before you take action. So, so my sponsor at the time, he was a Buddha guy, and he had taught me a little bit about meditation. So I'll never forget this. We're waiting in the middle of the fairway. Somebody's on the green, and I just close my eyes, breathe, and go, please reveal yourself to me. That's all he did. That was what I taught, and this is a meditation thing. So I did that, and this is what I got. Be nice to Bob. <laughs> it's like, I did not generate that. Let me tell you, I did not generate that thought because I'm ready to kill him. So I followed direction. I was nice to Bob the rest of the time, and we had a great day. It was fine. And I'll tell you what, why that, the whole thing about that was. So a year or two later, we're playing his, his place in the playoffs. And I hear Bob, and I'm on the practice screen getting ready, and I hear Bob coming. And he goes across right in front of me, but he doesn't, he doesn't acknowledge me. And, and so when he has back to, to me, I go, hey, is that my buddy Bob? That's what I said to him. You know what he did? He turned around, looked at me, didn't say a word, and came over and gave me a hug. You know? And it was like, that's what kind of day we'd had. And he gave me a hug. And that was a big deal. And I remember we had dinner a couple years after that, after playing. And it was just like, so it was, I was just willing to learn. And I've had some other stuff happen. This is all on golf course, too. I was in a big match with a big shot. 
and we went to extra holes, and I'll never forget, it was tight, it was a tough match, and I had to hit this big shot over a eucalyptus tree, and I get over the ball, and something inside of me says, Mike, loosen your hands, just loosen your hands. And I hit a great shot right back into the fairway, got on, made par, the guy I played with made bogey, and I won the match on the ex extra hole. And it's just intuitive, and that, that's one of the promises that it talks about when they read it at the end of the meeting. We will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. And, and so, um, <laughs> you know, it's just amazing. Um, I'm almost going to cry. I've led a life that is just, it's unbelievable. I didn't even really talk about a lot of it. And to go from the person I was to the person I am today, it's just unbelievable, you know? It's like, uh, I didn't talk about this either. Um, uh, my sobriety date, I like, I, when people tell their sobriety date right off the back, it's like le reading the last page of a book, you know? So, my sobriety date is October 22nd, 1985. I got sober when I was 24 years old. I am now 61 years old and I've been sober 36 years. And I've lived a life that is beyond my wildest dreams. And I still, trust me, I am still working on me. There's still stuff that I have to do. But it, it's just been wonderful. And I can tell you that I was sitting in a big meeting. It was my birthday. I mean, it is a big meeting, a couple hundred people. And I'm having to take my birthday, or, which I don't like, but I was going to take, I take it. And I remember, what am I going to say, you know, at this thing? And all I could think about was what a big effect Alcoholics Anonymous had had on my life way bigger than anything that I'd ever had ever. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, is the biggest opportunity in my life was alcoholic or is Alcoholics Anonymous, but it took 25 years to realize that. I'm a little slow, I understand, but you know, and you're probably, if you're new and you're in your first 90 days, you're going, what the hell is he talking about? But I can tell you right now, the effort that it took to do this and staying sober and doing the right thing, it, it, was, it was like, it's the keys to the kingdom. But, and, the, and the thing that I'll, I'll explain, the last thing I have a friend that I've known for all this time, and he's got a couple years more than this, and he says this, he goes, Alcoholics Anonymous works a lot better staying sober continuously. You know, so the key is, is I don't care who, who it is. I experienced it. I hit bumps in the red. The key is, is I, I stayed here, I kept going, I shared that with people that were close to me, sponsors, and eventually you get past those bumps in the road and then it's smooth sailing again. But, but it, it, it doesn't work very well if I drink when that stuff happens, guess what? It makes it worse. So, so what I learned was uh, stay here, stay sober, this is the best deal <laughs> I experienced. Thanks for letting me share.